Q you on eight. Q you on eight. K, you're clear. Stand by for your base. Welcome to EMS Cast, where we provide high-level education for you, the providers on the streets. I'm your host, Ross Orpitz, and today we have a really great podcast. We're going to be talking about trauma, and specifically, how can we do trauma better? Trauma can be scary. It's gruesome. It's often visually disturbing. It's chaotic. It's sometimes unsafe. These factors all create a really stressful, anxiety-provoking situation. And then you combine this type of situation with the fact that we may have a critically ill patient where we have only minutes or even seconds to make decisions about interventions that can truly make a difference in outcome. When we talk about trauma being algorithmic, that's out of necessity. We have to make these split second decisions with little mental energy wasted and still have a system in place to prevent us from missing other life-threatening injuries. The problem is most of the algorithms that exist in the literature were actually developed in the hospital where we have more than enough hands than we need. We can perform so many procedures at one time simultaneously, and we have surgeons standing by ready to take the patient to the operating room as soon as it is indicated. So what do we do in the pre-hospital setting with limited resources, limited manpower, less tools, no x-ray vision? What's our algorithm? If everything were to align perfectly, how would we run the ideal trauma call? Cue my guest today, Dave Edwards, one of the masterminds and creators behind this document we're going to talk about today. Dave is a seasoned paramedic with more than 15 years of experience, including serving as the captain of quality for the Denver Health Paramedic Division for three of those years. Currently, he is the assistant director of clinical performance for the emergency medical response system in Denver. This position involves overseeing the clinical quality of everything in the emergency response system from the initial answer of 911, what's your emergency, to the first responders arriving on scene and through delivery of that patient to the hospital. Dave Edwards has spent literally years working with seasoned paramedics and pre-hospital docs to create what they call the ideal trauma call. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ross. It's great to be here. Really excited. All right, Dave, tell us about how and why this project came about. Sure. You know, Ross, you, you really hit the nail on the head about three different ways in the intro, and I'd, I'd like to touch on them here before we go on and get into them deeper. First, chaos and gruesomeness. My first serious trauma as a paramedic isn't the basis for this call, but it's what I refer to a lot when I think about how, how calls can go wrong and how they can become chaotic and gruesome. And it was on an isolated country road about 40 minutes from a general hospital. We covered trauma in school. We talked about it. We talked about the algorithms. We talked about the, the golden hour and the platinum 10 minutes. It was hammered into us. If I took 10 minutes on scene and then still raced this patient to the hospital, I'm outside of that golden hour, that platinum 10 minutes. It took us 20 minutes to get there, but this was a motorcycle crash on this country road. One patient, everything on this patient was broken except for the helmeted head. So awake, alert, in pain, not cooperative, but Humpty Dumpty. And I look at that and say, what algorithm do I follow? Because when I got there, they were still in a ditch, not packaged. What do I do with my 10 minutes? What do I do in an ambulance? How do I organize this call? When we talk about algorithmic approach to trauma, we talk about a protocol. And most systems have a trauma protocol. And then supporting that, they have a head injury protocol, a spinal injury protocol, a chest trauma protocol, an abdomen protocol, everything. But what do we do when it's all of those? There's no clear link to say, go to this protocol from that one. How do you prioritize your activities? How do you, how do you determine what's most important in that moment when you have a lot of things to choose from? The other thing we also don't talk about is what's important for the hospital when we deliver them. What's the best way to get that patient to them? So I'll argue that I don't think trauma is as algorithmic as many other calls. Cardiac arrests are algorithmic. Even chest pain is mostly algorithmic. But many approach systems approach to trauma isn't. It isn't supported by an algorithm. 
And then you lay on top of that, what do you do when you have a second, a third patient as critical as your first? No algorithm covers that. Hearing you tell that story, I can so relate to one of my early trauma calls as a paramedic too, where I arrived on scene to just this gruesome accident, this vehicle, this sedan is twisted metal. There's a patient in the passenger seat who's got agonal respirations, unresponsive, fire still working on extricating her. They have the jaws of life trying to cut the doors off. And then there's a patient sitting on the sidewalk. There's a patient in the truck that hit the sedan. And I spent most of that call just running in circles, trying to be like, okay, I got to get this from the ambulance. So I got to see this patient or I got to w- check on this patient. And, and I didn't have a great idea of the principles we're going to talk about in a second on how to approach this better. And so I think that's true for me. I think a lot of our listeners can relate to this too. You work with Denver paramedics and and not to toot their horn too much, but they are quite possibly one of the best EMS systems when it comes to trauma. They're, they're the knife and gun club. They pride themselves on the level of care they provide when it comes to trauma. That has grown from the strong medical direction they've had through the years and the ability to learn and grow from trauma surgeons in the area who quite literally wrote the textbooks on modern trauma care. So in a system like Denver that is already so high functioning in this regard, why create something like this? Is it is it truly needed in, in the system you work in? That's a great question, man. One that I still continually answer to a lot of people today because part of this answer goes back many years when I took over the quality captain position and we met with the medical directors off campus. We had this big planning meeting about how we were moving forward. What were our plans for the future? And I pitched that we focused on our strengths to keep them good, to keep them great. A lot of the aspects of of what made us great, I don't know that we had the the data to say we were great. We knew we were great because when we got into the hospital, a physician said, great job. But I needed something more than that. So let's focus on what we do great. Pediatrics, cardiac trauma, those were some of the ones we did. We we all agreed on that. We rolled out hand heavy, which improved our, our pediatric care. We rolled out high performance CPR, which improved our cardiac arrest care. And then, we, I don't know say we forgot about trauma, but we didn't know how to address trauma. We, we picked away little pieces of it, and we just didn't know where to go. And then I, I was sitting down with some of my peers, Will Barry being one of them, and I sat down and made a list of like, these are all the things we can work on. What should our next project be? But then next to each one I marked, is it currently a strength or a weakness? Is it a strength that we better, or is it a weakness that we bring up and improve? And we all agreed trauma was the way to go. So we worked on trauma, and I... I didn't know exactly where to start, but I knew I knew that if we just rested on our laurels, that being great at trauma would keep us great at trauma. I knew we would we would fail at that, that that would not be a, a, a recipe for success long term. And I often pitch the idea that we're playing an infinite game. We're not playing a game finite, defined by rules. We're not playing a game that you win. And once you sh- stop striving to be better, you start losing your edge right away. That's a nice shout out to the book. The Infinite Game, which you actually recommended to me and I and I read, and it's a phenomenal book by Simon Sinek, and I recommend anybody looking to better their organization read that book. And you're so right. In EMS, as a whole, we're playing an infinite game. We have to continue to strive to get better, and that's, that's what I love about this. And honestly, that's what this podcast is all about. We want to bring a mentality of never stop learning, never stop improving, be better than you were yesterday, no matter how good you already were yesterday. And this concept of continual improvement is a philosophy that is built into this project. So we're actually going to talk more about how we can improve something like this even further at the end of the show. And I'm really looking forward to that. And and you're going to want to stick around to hear it. But let's get into the meat of this document. Let's talk about how you actually went about building this document. And then we'll, we'll start breaking it down. Great. Again, it really came off the heels of implementing the high-performance CPR in Denver. It wasn't a model that we had been using. We were behind the game in that, but but we caught up and we did it. And then the idea of the ideal trauma came to mind. The ideal trauma being that if we could, like you acknowledge, if we could script the, the perfect trauma call, knowing that there's so many factors that are going to keep any call from being ideal, but if we know what, what our target is, we can aim for it on every call. And the idea of ideal trauma came to mind and, and it started as, hey, If I could address single patient trauma, if I could script perfect single patient trauma, picking one person up off a sidewalk, and then understandably, it didn't take me long to realize that that wouldn't be a success, that the complication of trauma means multiple patients. And oftentimes that's, that's it. 
And that's kind of where the phases came from, because I decided that if we could start by by deciding what's important at each phase of a call, but it also is an information gathering tool to help me kind of structure it and said, no matter who's on scene of at, during this part of a call, what's most important that happens? And then the next phase and the next phase. Pretty much every trauma call has these phases. Almost every call has these phases, but every trauma call has the phases that we're going to talk about. So I went ahead and I started polling dozens of, of experienced street medics, new medics, field trainers, command staff. At the time, I only had three phases, but I said, if if you could do any of these things in, in this phase of the call, what would you do? And I, I labeled magnets and put them on a whiteboard and let them move them around and gave them time to think about it. Some some people just didn't even put them in the list. That's not important to me. I, I'm not, I wouldn't do that on a call. And I found that there was, there was some consistencies. Everybody's going to identify patients in phase one of the call, the original phase one. But also there was a lot of inconsistencies. There were a lot of people who would do different tasks, different skills, at different phases. They didn't think they were important. And one of the main keys that, of the phases that I was aiming for is if we could provide guidance that said, the, if you have enough time to do three things, what are the most important three things? And then if you have time to do more, three more, what are those three things? But no medics could agree on what the most important three things were. And that's because a lot of the things we do and how we prioritize them were inconsistencies based on anecdote and lore. My field trainer told me this thing when I went through the program 10 years ago. So that's what I do. And maybe it was a conversation with a doctor that initiated that lore, but it's 10 years old now. <laughs> Who knows if it's still adequate? I was guilty of that as a field trainer in our system, in every system. That I, Hey, one time somebody told me this thing, this is what we want. The idea was born of, of kind of packing a better mental toolkit. Can I tell you, if you have time to do three tasks, what are the most, absolutely most important? And then if there's another time for three, what are those three? And it wasn't me deciding what those priorities were. So as we de developed the phases, we sat down with emergency doctors, EMS docs, trauma surgeons, and we just said, what impacts the system the most and what tasks are the most important throughout these phases? And that was the bread and butter of how it all started. Let's start talking about the phases. What phases did you break these down into and, and how did you decide on those? The background a little bit, the original phases is I wanted to know what happened on a call. That was the paramedic. So from the moment you show up, what do you do until the patient's loaded? Now that shifted because the more we talked about it, the deeper we got into it, there was a phase before that. The emergency doesn't start when the paramedic shows up, when the first first responder arrives, which is how we had marked it originally. The emergency starts at the time of injury. For us, that's 911 activation. When the call comes into the system, that's when the call starts. And we can improve our system from the start. And whether some agencies, the call takers, the 911 system, fire department, paramedics are all in one shop, some are multi-agency, it doesn't matter because no matter what, there's a system that is established and we have to be able to say, 911, what's your emergency? What can we do better? Are we good at determining the nature of a call? Are we good at identifying the number of potential patients to give the crews the, you know, the cognitive heads up of, hey, you're, you're actually going to a call with multiple patients? Safety concerns and locations of the patient. I refer a lot of times, there's big parks in cities, big parks in small towns that have an address. So when a 911 responder, be it BLS, ALS, they're sent to a call, they go to the address, but those parks are big. Where's my patient? You're going to an alley. Where in the alley? Give me a heads up. Don't make me walk around and look. So if the call taker can determine that as best as possible, give it a huge heads up to the first responders when they arrive. Yeah. I love this philosophy. And it goes to the fact that just as we talk about on this podcast, that patient care doesn't start when that patient arrives to the emergency department. It starts long before that with everything you guys are doing in the field. The patient care doesn't start when you arrive on scene. It starts with that first 911 call. And so just as each rung up the ladder has a different part, it's all important. And so if you truly want to implement something like this, if you truly want to be great and better your system, you have to work with all facets of it. 
You have to work with the 911 call takers, whether they're a part of your organization or not. You have to work with them about what's important. You have to work with your first responders, your EMTs, your paramedics. And then and just like you did when you developed this, you have to work with your emergency department. You got to talk to your doctors about, hey, what matters when we show up? What we did before we got here? What, what makes the biggest impact for you guys and for this patient when they arrived at the emergency department? It's a continuum of care. And I, and I love the focus on this document. So, so what comes after that phase? Phase two starts with the original phase one. Phase two is all activities from when the first first responder arrives. I don't care if it's somebody in a fly car, a fire truck, if it's the ambulance, whoever the first first responder is until the patient is loaded in the ambulance. So all of the things that happen on the street part of the scene. And this is true whether there's one patient or eight patients. For each patient, what is happening on the scene before the patient's put in the ambulance. This is where we're considering ingress and egress of our vehicles and our access to the patient, identifying all the patients, triaging the scene, determining if additional resources are needed, getting them en route, stopping major bleeding, BLS airway management, packaging to load the patient, and setting up the ambulance so that the provider is ready to go. Talk a little bit more about some of the things that that seem basic, but so often get forgotten on these calls. And that's making sure you identify all the patients that are there and making sure you identify your ingress and egress long before you even start thinking about patient care. Talk about why that's so important. Yeah, identifying all patients is clearly important because I think the, the default to providers is to provide care. So when we get into the high moments of stress, when we show up on a scene, you described it agonal patient in the seat of the car, somebody on a curb. But the default is is to treat life threats, to treat patients. So when I'm in a moment of stress, I'm going to default to my to that. But what I need to do is determine who else. If I'm not starting additional resources, if I'm not identifying major life threats on the multiple patients, why is only one patient getting the care that they deserve? They all need it. You're going to end up running in circles like I did on my first trauma call. Exactly. Like, like we all have. And then ingress and egress is probably the most overlooked. And I encourage people, and I try to to tell new paramedics, do this on every call. Every call you get on. If you don't know the city, pull up in front of the house, ask your trainer, ask your partner, or just know what direction are we headed? What street did we come from? You never know when you're going to need an additional resource. And that resource could be anything. Animal control, the energy company to turn off power, fire truck, police, additional ambulances. The last thing you want is your narrow street to be blocked by one of those vehicles nose to nose when you're trying to leave with a critical patient. Getting your vehicles positioned properly so that you can get out and the next one behind you and get out right behind you, no reason to waste time, valuable seconds doing that. So we've done all of these things. We've identified all our patients. We've made sure we have our ingress, egress, and then basic care has started with stop major bleeding BLS airway management and packaging that patient to the ambulance. This is, I think, another big point that can really speed and increase the level of care you provide in the pre-hospital setting, and that's packaging the patient. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Stopping major bleeding, of course, is, is super important. But having that patient, when an ambulance pulls up, whoever the first responder is, if they're not the transporting agents, if they are the transporting agent, Having that patient ready to be picked up and go, there are so many calls that I've been on in my, my career having a provider, again, they could be a, have transport, transport capacity or not, but showing up into the backyard of a stabbing patient and the person's just laying in the grass and they have been for five minutes. So what am I doing? I'm doing the thing that they should have done, getting them ready to pick up and go. If every ambulance pulled up to a trauma scene and the first first responders had them packaged on the sidewalk ready to go, then that phase two, I mean, shaving those seconds or even minutes off of that call, so valuable to the patient just to be ready to put in the ambulance, get treatment started and go. Absolutely. Okay. So the patient's been packaged and is now loaded in our ambulance. Let's talk about phase three. Yeah. So this is everything that happens from, again, stretchers locked in the ambulance until the driver puts it in drive. The keys here, we encourage without delaying transport, we want to see Ideally, I like the first IV attempt to happen in the back of an ambulance, more controlled than on the street, and the higher likelihood of success if you're doing it before you're driving down the road, especially emergent to a hospital. But first IV attempt, get the patient trauma exposed, first set of vital signs, and treating any of the life threats that you find. And I, I get a lot of questions about why IV attempt on scene, but I encourage if you can do it in the first 90 seconds, that's golden. My perfect 
ideal call is the driver of the ambulance hopping in the back, starting an IV on the right arm, taping it down, having it ready to go, ready to draw blood, and out. Have one IV access established for the attending paramedic who's in the back on the way to the hospital. One of the things that I've experienced firsthand, I've witnessed as a trainer, I've witnessed as a driving partner, when you miss that IV on the way to the hospital, it almost tanks the call. Because a missed IV isn't just a waste of time and a missed skill. It's a mess <laughs> that you then have to clean up and bandage. The second access is harder. So if the driver starts out on the right, the left access is what's available to the attending paramedic. So much easier on the way to the hospital for a second line. But there's also just a stressor that's relieved knowing I'm getting my patient to the hospital with at least one line already. And if I miss the second, so be it. But if I get the second, I'm a rock star. I'm a hero. <laughs> I go in with two. And then, of course, most of these patients are hemorrhaging. Access just gets harder the longer you wait the later in the call it gets. So getting that early and fast, the better. I think there's a lot of discussion about why do anything on scene. We talk about what these patients really need is hot lights and cold steel, right? They need an operating room. But truth be told, being on that other side now in the emergency department, receiving a patient without an IV makes things so much more chaotic, even within the emergency department where we have a bunch of hands to try to make that happen. And so it truly can be really important establishing that IV before you get to the hospital. Now, that being said, we don't want to attempt four times and actually delay care or transport, right? And so, so there's that balance there. And you guys talk about doing these quick things on scene, but limiting it to ideally less than 90 seconds, ideally just one attempt at an IV, and then hit that road and start heading towards those hot lights and cold steel. And Ross, I'll tell you, one of the things that really made me nervous was even putting a time on here at all. In Denver, we aim for a six-minute scene time for penetrating trauma, nine minutes scene time for blunt trauma. And I think that's great. But I think that there's an anchoring bias that occurs a lot of times with these where either people feel like, well, I have six minutes, let's use it. Or I have nine minutes, let's use it when they could have been off scene after four. The other concern is, do we start manipulating times to benefit ourselves? Do I wait to call on scene to shorten that time? Do I call leaving the scene early as I'm walking to the driver's seat just to buy those extra seconds for my partner. And that's not patient care. That doesn't do anything to help my patient. It, it pads my stats, but it's not, it doesn't support us. So I was nervous about putting time other than to say, don't waste time on scene. Use it, don't waste it. I like that. So now we're, we're rolling down the road. We're transporting this patient. We're to phase four. What do we want to have happen between vehicle going in drive and hitting those emergency department doors. Yeah. So this is securing more airway and respiratory management, making sure that you're doing that, assessing the needs as you go. Make that biophone call. And this is the fine balance of when is the perfect time, but make that biophone call, give the hospital enough heads up so that they can be ready. Start that second IV, repeat your assessment of vital signs, CPR if it's needed, and then other tasks and skills as appropriate, and then get that patient packaged for delivery to the ED. Here we are again at packaging. So we package to get into the ambulance and now we're talking about packaging to deliver to the ED. This is actually, again, very super important and often overlooked. So talk about that a little. Sure. So one of the things that happened in, in phase three was I trauma exposed my patient. Ideally, I'm not doing that street side for a lot of reasons. One is ambient temperature. One is public view. I do that in the back of the ambulance. There's nothing I need to see street side. So I do it in the back of the ambulance. I need to get that patient repackaged not only to, to protect temperature and privacy for transport, but I don't want to be waiting with my back doors of my ambulance wide open in park, still doing things in the ambulance bay. As soon as it's in park, the back door's open, we're ready to take that patient out and get them in and have everything positioned so that the handoff, the movement from my stretcher to the hospital bed is as swift and clean as possible. All right. Ambulance is in park, back doors open. We're now moving that patient into the emergency department and handing them over to their care. This is actually a phase in and of itself. So talk to us about this. Yeah. So this back door is open, stretcher comes out, deliver the patient to the assigned room. It seems obvious, but it's what we're doing in this scene. We're giving the handoff report and the handoff report should be organized better than any other one. We don't list it in the document, but I recommend 
kind of a title. The first thing you comes out of your mouth is why was it a, an emergent return? Why did you come back lights and sirens? Sometimes that gets lost when a patient is awake and talking and you're like, well, wait, why did you come back emergent? But to be able to say, because the car was in eight pieces, <laughs> you know, it, it fell off a 15 foot ladder. He doesn't look like it, but this is why. And then if it's a trauma arrest, I mean, be brief, get out of the way. Like lost pulses at this time, clear back, let everybody get in there and do the job that they're supposed to be doing for the ED interventions. And then have a plan to manage multiple patients. So if you have two patients that you transported, have it decided before those back doors open, who's staying in the ambulance with the other patient, who's loading. Make sure you have it clear on the biophone that you maybe you need a bed brought out to help, but have all of that decided before the back doors open. Yeah. And when you arrive and you're looking for the room, make sure you have some way to easily identify the patient you have. This is one of three patients coming. They're the one with the open tip fib or, yeah. or whatever easy identifier that differentiates them from the other patients can help curb some of that chaos that can occur in the emergency department as they're receiving multiple patients at one time. We should add that to the, the five R's, the right room. Right patient, right room. There you go. <laughs> yeah, like that. All right. So we've we've completed our care. We've handed the patient over to the emergency department. Now they have a set of priorities and phases that they're going to go through in treating this patient. Are, are we done here at phase five? No. And this is kind of built into the, the lifelong learning aspect of this call. So next is the peer debrief. That's sitting in the front of the ambulance, talking it over with your partner. Hey, how did you think that went? What could we have done better? This is something I noticed that you did. I've never seen anybody do that before. Why did you do that? Ask the questions, have the conversations while things are fresh. If you have a student writer, have the conversation with them about the things you were doing and why, what their thought process was, what they learned from the call. If there's commanders on scene, same thing. What did you guys see? What was the scene like after we left? How could we have done better? How could you have done better? Have that conversation. That's the peer debrief. And this is, again, this is one of those pieces that we should be doing on every call. I encourage it. Every new person, got to ask yourself the question after every single call, what did I do well? What could I have done better? You need to pat yourself on the back for the rock star stuff we do. We also have to make sure that those rock star things aren't accidents. Like, (laughs) Make sure you own it. It was intentional. But also, what could I learn? What can I carry on? What could I have done better on this call? There is no such thing as the ideal call. So what could you have done to make it more ideal? And then next is in our system, we have peer review, the actual QA process, the call audit process. That's still part of this call and being open to that and accepting of the feedback that they have. So when they come back and say, hey, based on these phases, you, you worked outside of that, maybe with good reason, but why? And then whether you have an after action report or an MCI or a multi-patient kind of review committee process, that, that's the last piece, that after action ever learning process. I love the introspective part of this immediately after the call when it's still fresh in your mind and things are still clear. And I love the idea of, you know, giving yourself props for what you did right, making sure that you did those on purpose or if you didn't, how you're going to do them on purpose next time. And I love reflecting on what you could have done better. This is not a time to beat yourself up and tell yourself that you suck. This is a time to give yourself forgiveness because we're all human we all can do better. We can all make mistakes. And so it's not about what you did wrong and how bad you are, but it's how can you be better next time? Just like we talked about at the beginning, no matter how good you were on this call, how can you be even better next time? We're going to have all of these show notes that we've talked about today online. And with this is actually a really cool graphic. So you can't see this while you're listening to us, but there's a nice graphic that breaks down these phases in the timeline that they occur with kind of these actions and priorities that we've been talking about. So we're going to move on. And there's actually a a multiple patient part of this, which you guys are still working on finishing and fine tuning. And I really look forward to having you back to talk about that with our MCI expert, Will Berry, in the future. But moving on, this document continues on. I mean, that was only half this document. Now you have in here principles of trauma. We already talked about the phases, the priorities, the actions we need to do. Why include this section? The principles of trauma support the algorithm of the protocol. And I'd like to use the words heuristic and algorithmic. So the algorithmic part is built so that you don't have to think, right? That you follow the order of processes and it's very if then. It's incredibly important to have the support for providers there to have, I know that when this call happens, I follow a, a chain of order that takes me to this. But I also think that 
truly job satisfaction comes from having a heuristic job, a job that I can think through. And paramedics should be thinkers. We shouldn't be following an algorithm. So can we give a document support supported by, again, trauma surgeons, ER physicians, EMS physicians, other providers, the why behind the rules? And there are times where it's hard to piece together. I go from trauma to shock trauma to my head trauma protocol. How do I piece it together and why? This is that overlapping part. And this is the part that's going to be more alive than the protocols. The algorithm won't change too much. This will change as we learn more, as we experience more, and gives, again, the heart to what we're doing. Just like we talked about in the beginning of this episode, how trauma isn't truly algorithmic. These scenes are so different. Every single one has unique challenges that you have to deal with. So I love this idea of having principles to guide you as you deal with those different scenarios, you deal with those different challenges. The actions that we talked about in those phases may not actually always occur in the exact same orders. And you saw that as you were talking to seasoned paramedics when you were, when you were developing this, some would put different priorities over others. And that probably would depend on the scene or the situation or the trauma. And so having principles to guide you so that you kind of know when to break the rules, I think is phenomenal. So, so what, what are the principles? So we start first, the overall principles of trauma are composed of three major components, quality, speed, and teamwork. Quality, we want highly trained, excellent providers out there, ones who are ever improving, always learning with every tool that they have in their toolkit at their disposal. The next is speed. I also like to interchange timeliness in with speed because speed doesn't always, there's an efficiency that goes with timeliness that it's not always about fastest. And when you put time as the sole indicator, you're really losing a piece there, but it's one of the three. And that's just a rapid assessment and treatment, being efficient at what you're doing, doing things at the right time. And then lastly, teamwork. It's the high function of an entire system from the caller, the call taker, the first responders, the emergency department, the surgeons, everybody that participates in that care. Trauma is a team sport. Yes. I love that. And I, and I love your idea of timeliness, not, not speed, because we talked about how missing an IV or not establishing an IV in the pre-hospital setting, although not critical or life or death for this patient can cause delays in the emergency department. When they show up without an IV, things become more chaotic with us. We have a delay to getting them blood. Even though starting that IV may not be the speediest thing, it's that efficiency that prevents delays down the road with the team in the emergency department. And so I love that. So moving on, what's our what's our next principle? So the second principle is circulatory management. This is really stopping the hemorrhage is the first and most important thing. And then we have a section on fluid challenge after that, but stop the bleeding and fluid challenge. Why is stop the bleeding the most important thing? That's what's going to kill you. (laughs) It's the most preventable. Like we, you know, ABC is the CAB. We need to be paying attention to that and addressing it however we can, whether it's tourniquet, direct pressure, just that becomes the most important. And it may take a person applying direct pressure and you lose a person for the call. It's that important. I love that. In this, you talk about trying fluid challenges. We don't have blood. Most systems don't have blood on their rigs. And so if somebody is hypotensive, what are we going to do? And what are going to be our guidelines for triggering that action? Managing and paying attention to your blood pressure along the way. But if there's no head injury in your patient and their systolic blood pressure is below 80, then we really want to do a 500 cc bolus, keep it at that and pay attention to that. If it's above 80 and no head injury, I want to leave them there. I don't want to give a challenge. We used to two large bore IVs, two open leaders. You lose focus on what those bags are doing. You get to the hospital, you've got two empty bags, you got two liters in them. Horrible for my patient. Why is that horrible for the patient? First of all, managing a blood pressure around 80, the body's trying to heal. So if I do have any internal clotting happening, my direct pressure is working, those kind of things, anything higher than 80, I risk pushing that clot out from the inside pushing up too much pressure. Studies are showing that 80 is my mark of where I want to stay for that. That, and I'm just replacing all of my oxygen carrying blood with water. (laughs) And it's doing nothing for my patient. Yeah, totally. And then you have diluting 
clotting factors yeah. potentially, as well as most bags on the rig are coming straight off a cold shelf. And then we're, you know, that triangle of death in trauma patients, we're now making them hypothermic, which makes it even more difficult for them to clot. You talked about, you know, if there's no suspicion of, of head injury, we're using kind of 80 as our cutoff for, for triggering this action. What about if there is a head injury and why is that different? We set the rule if there's a suspicion of head injury. So if the mechanism has you to believe it, if the patient is altered, if there's head trauma that makes you think that there's a internal head injury, we would give challenges up to 100 or more because unlike the body's hypotension, hypotension and head injury is going to be a killer. And there's going to be a long-term detrimental meta effect if, if we let back. There are plenty of studies that show that one of the biggest predictors of poor neurologic outcome following a head injury is hypotension. That and fever makes a big difference in head injured patients. Let's move on to the next principle. What's principle three? Trauma arrest. Too many times, I think, we don't run a lot of trauma arrests. We, as paramedics, don't. They don't happen that often that we work them, we get there, and too often we default. So again, in a moment of stress, we default to what we're comfortable with. High performance CPR has been hammered into our head and we have to recognize that this is not like a medical arrest. I don't want to stay on scene doing compressions for 20 minutes. I don't want to stay on scene doing compressions for two minutes. I need to package my patient, get them out and go. Chest compressions are not my high priority. I think people default to that because again, they, they see a pulseless patient, they say, but I have to do this. Chest compressions are a priority when everything else is taken care of. It shouldn't distract from starting the IV bio phone call, doing a needle decompression or managing the airway, moving the patient. Don't delay transport. Don't delay getting the patient out of the back of the ambulance for chest compressions. So it's not the high priority that it is in a medical arrest. Yeah. We talk about in trauma, reversing the underlying cause. There are few actions that can quickly reverse what may have led that person into arrest. And so we want to focus on reversing those as quickly as possible because this has a very poor prognosis and we want to act quickly and chest compressions aren't reversing anything. So then what are our priorities that are going to come in above chest compressions? So before chest compressions or stop chest compressions to do the thing. So if you were doing chest compressions and you realize that you don't have the IVIO access you need, Get that. Again, the earlier you get it, the better. The longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. Set up the hospital. If you're the only one in the back or people in the back of the ambulance are doing other things, it is okay to stop compressions to alert the hospital that you're coming. Needle decompression if necessary. Management of airway. And these are in no particular order. But airway management. If you need to get a tube, if you need to bag them, that's much more important than chest compressions. Capnography and moving the patient. Those are much more important than, than the act of chest compressions. So to be clear, you guys aren't necessarily saying don't do chest compressions at all. You're saying these actions that you just talked about, IV access, biophone call, needle decompression, airway management, capnography, moving patient, these specific actions have a higher priority. So if you can do them in conjunction with chest compressions, sure, go ahead and do that. But if chest compressions at all get in your way of doing these things or delay your ability to do these things, stop chest compressions so you can do one of these higher priority things. Exactly. D depending on the resources you have, have available and what those resources are doing dictates whether you can or not. What other principles are there in traumatic arrests? So after that is determine and report the accurate time of when pulses were lost. And in a trauma arrest, we want an oral intubation, two attempts max, followed by an eye gel, but oral intubation is going to be better for securing the airway in a trauma arrest. Why is determining the accurate time of when pulse is lost important? We don't want paramedics in the field making clinical decisions based on when the pulses were lost. They shouldn't dictate what hospital they go to. It shouldn't dictate whether or not they transport the patient. But losing a pulse is going to arm the emergency department with whether they're going to crack that chest or not. And having an accurate time is going to give that patient the best care that they need and not waste time and resources if it's outside the scope of survival. Yeah, so many hospitals traumatic arrest algorithms determine whether or not they're going to perform heroic measures such as a resuscitative thoracotomy based on when that patient lost pulses. I like that we're not focusing on that decision ourselves. That's That decision is for somebody else to make, but those people need this accurate time in order to make that decision to the best of their abilities. So I like that. You talked about 
airway management and a trauma arrest. And now we're actually going to move to principle four, which is airway management. So let's talk more about that. This one we broke into two sections and it's guidance and context. In a way, it's the principle of the principle <laughs> and then the, the meat of the principle. So first, we want to make sure that we're defining airway management as the skill of assessing and supporting respiratory function. This isn't the skill of inserting an endotracheal tube. It's assessment of the airway. And maybe that's all. If we assess that it's adequate, then that's my airway management all the way up until a crike if needed. It's everything in between, whether it's a cannula, a non rebreather, bagging them, criking them, intubating them, eye gel. It's any of those things, including assessing airway and ventilatory function. I love that airway management is so much more than just plastic between the focal cords. I think whenever anybody mentions airway management, that's the first thing anybody thinks about. But actually, there, there's so many more important things that go into this skill than intubating somebody. And we talk about this a lot in our physiologically difficult airway series. So I encourage you to go back and listen to those. But the vast majority of airway management in those situations is actually resuscitate and avoid intubating if you can. Airway management, we have so many other tools that we can use before we actually have to intubate, and there are some harmful effects of intubation. So we need to be cognizant of that. What else is in here? Next, supporting what you were just saying, in trauma, we don't intubate for airway protection. In the paramedic school textbooks, in paramedic school lectures, it sounds as though blood, vomitus, fluids, the presence, I'm going to intubate. I'm going to do it to secure the airway. But we really need to assess, do I need to secure an airway? Because airways inherently are secure. <laughs> so can I suction? That's a thing that we often neglect in, in pre-hospital care. But can I do those things to clear a liquid rather than, oh, there's secretions I need to intubate? We don't do it just for that. So we do it for an actual airway obstruction. We do it for an airway that can't be protected by other measures. Great. So this happens with every paramedic. You always get pushed to the scenario of, yeah, but what if I have no other option? So what if we have no other option? We need to intubate. What's the principle guiding us around that? Absolutely. Because this, you're right. This is not an, an absolute don't intubate. It's intubate when you know you need it. So principle guidance three, do it in route. We don't delay transport for this. If it's indicated, it should be done. But again, unless there's no other option, do it on the way to the hospital. And if you're not successful, at least you're that many more seconds, minutes closer to true definitive care. We shouldn't be delaying transport for an intubation. The next point on here is talking about how intubation in the emergency department is different from intubation in the pre-hospital setting. Talk to us about that. Sure. One of the things that we're often taught as paramedics, and I think everybody, this is universal. You deliver a patient to the emergency department, pay attention to the first things that they do in the emergency department, because maybe that's what you should have done pre-hospital. I encourage students, listen to what the doctor's asking. Did you already ask those questions? Do you have answers to those? Because if not, they're questions you probably should have asked. And we take this to truth when we bring in a trauma patient, we were told not to intubate. We see that the first thing they do is secure in our way with an intubation. So I second guess myself. I leave. Next time I'll do that. But really, this isn't what we should be doing. It's, it's a totally different scenario. Sitting in a captain's chair, driving emergent to the hospital, my lighting, my environment, my space, it's all different. It's me alone in the back, maybe with one other provider. Compare that to an emergency department, front room, huge open room, eight people, many different skill levels. Of the eight people, at least three of them are skilled intubators. And they also have the pharmaceutical support that if it starts to go south, they can correct that in a way that we can't in, the, in most pre-hospital settings. Again, to that point, it comes back again, resuscitate before you intubate. And so this patient being intubated in the emergency department has the benefit of the resuscitation you provided in route, which increases the likelihood of success for the emergency department. And then the emergency department has more tools with pharmacists, with blood to further resuscitate just before or as they're intubating that patient, which is such a big part of that as well to preventing catastrophic outcomes from when we try to take that airway. And I think that's super important is because those eight people there, like you said, they're also doing things, right? <laughs> There's a lot of things happening at once. It's not intubation alone for that moment. There's three or four things happening. We can't do three or four things in the back of an ambulance. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so those are the principles within the principal inception moment. What's next? Next is the context. And these are almost 
rules. <laughs> These are how to apply the things that we, those thoughts we just put and are a little bit more hard and fast. But in a traumatic arrest, whether blunt or penetrating, like we said in, our, in the last section, oral intubation is preferred. Start there, two attempts maximum, and then go straight to an eye gel. And then uh, suspicion of head injury. So this comes back to the same kind of guidance that we had for permissive hypotension. If we believe that there's a head injury based on mechanism, based on the altered mentation of a patient, based on the trauma that we find, physical signs, we want to avoid hypotension, hypoxia, and hyperventilation. Critical. In intubation, we have to be aware that it causes the elevated intracranial pressure. So we should not be intubating head injured patients, especially nasal intubation. Totally contraindicated in the, in the head injured patient. Sometimes it seems good. Sometimes there's facial trauma. Just shouldn't be done, whether there's Trismus or not. Don't do it. And then supportive respirations, like the less invasive, the better with a head injured patient. And it's okay to dedicate a, two people to a good BVM seal, one doing the seal, one doing the bagging, not hyperventilating, not allowing hypoxia. This is the best thing for the patient. This is actually a big point and one that may actually get a lot of commentary and questions, and that's our change in approach to the head injured patient when it comes to the airway management and the fact that less is more. This comes out of some studies, albeit, you know, studying this patient population is very challenging, but we do have some studies that suggest intubation in the pre-hospital setting or even in the emergency department leads to poorer outcomes for these head injured patients as opposed to a very controlled OR setting. And the thought behind this is, the act of intubation increases intracranial pressure. And that is what their problem is. And so if you increase their intracranial pressure, you may actually decrease their neurologic outcome. And so the best that we can do to do it in a very gentle, controlled manner, we may have better ability to reduce our effect on that intracranial pressure. And so the least invasive is preferred here. Oxygen better than BVM if you can. BVM strongly preferred to eye gel if you can, which again is preferred to intubation because triggering those vocal cords are going to cause a lot of increase in intracranial pressure. And so obviously, if you can't control the airway, if you can't manage the airway, if you can't oxygenate or provide adequate respirations with the least invasive, you may have to go up the rung of the ladder. But the minute that you can control it, stop there in a head injured patient because the least invasive is the better. So what if there's no suspicion of head injury? With no suspicion of head injury, unresponsive patient, intubation is preferred. And if it's nasal intubation because the patient is not apneic, go ahead with that. Nasal intubation is, is fine. Penetrating trauma, same thing. Nasal or oral intubation, whatever is, is most appropriate for that patient. Either one is adequate, depending on what's best for the patient, based on the injuries that they have and their presentation. And then lastly, when we need it, the surgical airway is always the option. And when do we need the surgical airway? Those rules are hard, fast, when you cannot ventilate and you cannot intubate. All right, what are our next principles in trauma here? Communications, especially the ideal biophone call. This may change system to system, but really, what does the hospital need to know? When do they need to know it? Ideally, in our system, we're looking at a phone call that happens five to 10 minutes before arrival at the hospital. Anything short of that, it's hard to get the team assembled. It's hard to get the right people in the right room ready for a good response, a good welcoming team for that patient to be transferred and that care initiated and have those eight people doing what they're supposed to be doing. The proverbial eight, there might be more. <laughs> but also too much notice can be detrimental because you assemble that team and now you've got a team of people waiting a long time. So there's a sweet spot that we like to hit of about five to 10 minutes. Give them enough time to get there, but not enough time to lose patients. If it's a short transport, if you're talking less than five minutes, five minute transport time, call with less information that's still better. Getting the crew there, but if you can say, I don't have a full set of vital signs, I don't even have a full assessment done yet, but we are in the ambulance, I'm getting them trauma exposed right now. When we get there, I'll let you know more. That's so much better than no phone call or the phone call with the backup alarm going off. <laughs> Ideally, the information that we want to include, the reason for the call, Make sure you're confirming that you're going to the right hospital. The age of the patient with repeated digits, I could say 77, but I want to repeat that with a 7-7. Seven, seven. Last thing you want to do is set up a peds room because you think you get a 7-year-old or vice versa. Think that they said 77 and you're showing up with a 7-year-old. Different response. An explanation of the mechanism of injuries, blunt, 
what kind of mechanism was it? Was it blunt hit with a baseball bat or blunt fell three stories, blunt hit by a car, penetrating? What was the mechanism where the locations of the wound? What is my patient's mental status? Description of airway status. We've assessed that. We talked about what that airway management means. What is their status? What support are you providing? Make sure that that care can be handed off. We prefer a, at least a systolic blood pressure and a heart rate. But if you if you don't have that, at least a description of their status. They're pale. I can't feel a pulse. They're pale and I have a weak pulse. They're pale and they're not alert, whatever those are. And then if this doesn't spell it out, make sure that you tell them what your clinical concern was. Again, they might have good vital signs. They might have be awake and alert. But make sure that the mechanism, there's something about it that had you nervous, you're coming back with lights and sirens, and you need an immediate response from that team of physicians and nurses. That point is so important. I can't tell you how many times from receiving that bio phone call from paramedics coming emergent for something, I hang up the call and I go, I don't know what they're concerned about. I don't know why they're coming here. Everything sounded fine with the vitals. They didn't describe a terrible mechanism. And so that can be super important. If it's not obvious, make that point. I get phone calls from doctor's offices too, where I have to ask, what are you concerned about that you want me to do when that patient gets here? So include that if you need to. This is where the, one of the big problems we have is we're talking on the phone and we don't, we don't realize as paramedics that the doctor can't see what we're seeing. We believe we're describing this perfect scenario. And oftentimes it just isn't as perfect as we think we're, we're telling it. There are people with PhDs in communication. It's, a, it's not an easy thing, though we think it's so simple. I said these things, therefore you heard it, you understand it, you see what I see. Really explaining what that clinical concern is big impact on, on how that patient's received. Yeah. It's that shared mental model. Yeah. Right? And I have to refer back to another one of our old episodes here, the biophone communications episode with Whitney Barrett. Please go back and listen to that because developing that shared mental model can be something that's very challenging for us to do, but is so critically important when we're discussing these important things over the phone. And then lastly, just make sure you're closing off with an estimated time in route. So we specify that, I nerd it out on, it's not a time of arrival. I'm not telling you I'm showing up at 12, 12. <laughs> it's how much longer do I have in my drive? Yeah, perfect. So that was a lot. We, we just talked about a lot there, but honestly, these phone calls should be very brief and concise. And when you say it all out loud, when you explain it all out loud, it, you know, we, we drag it out like this, but I think looking at it on paper can can maybe be even better. So we, we are going to, like I said, have all of these up on our website, emspodcast.com in the show notes. And I encourage you to look at principles five communication. And these are the important things that you want to get across in 30 seconds or less when you call to set up that hospital. And ideally you're going to call to set it up five to 10 minutes prior to getting there. If you have that ability. So you're going to want to include the reason for the call and confirm where you're going. You want to give the age and repeat that with digits so there's no confusion. You want to give the mechanism, whether it's blunt or penetrating, the location of the wounds, and the mental status. Then you're going to describe the airway status, give vitals, include your clinical concern if it's not obvious, and give them your estimated time to arrival. What's the next principle we're going to be talking about here? So the next principle is resource utilization. In Denver, we have a BLS fire department first response before ALS transport ambulances arrive. Our hope is that when the first responders arrive, they have the time to triage the scene. And triage, different than prioritization of transport, triage is determining the life threats, red, yellow, green patients. Count those up, report those on the air, and then we send an ambulance response that's respective to that. Rather than waiting until the first ambulance arrives reassessing and calling for resources. This should be done by the first units on scene. Again, BLS, ALS, whoever the first is, do a total patient count and call them out, get the resources to the scene so we can get them off the scene. And you guys use SALT triage, which our listeners can look up if they're not familiar with that and become a little more familiar with that. We're going to breeze over this a little bit because I am so looking forward to you and Will Berry going way more in detail about this because there's a lot to unpack here. So look forward to that for future episodes. But let's move on to our final principle here. And no EMS document is complete without a special population section. Why are young and old and pregnant people so difficult? Because they're so different. <laughs> and ultimately, like right to the regard that a pregnant patient, a trip and fall from a standing height can be a life threat to the patient and to the fetus. So we have to pay special attention to that. 
this document, probably not as thorough as it should be even. And I've even considered, do we put in each individual principle, do we have a pregnancy section? Do we have a special population section in each principle? Elderly, again, unlike many adult age patients, we have to consider non-accidental trauma. Many of our 17-year-old, 25-year-old patients aren't anticoagulated. So we have to make sure we're asking about those medications that the patient's taking, checking those home meds, seeing if, if that's what they're on, knowing what those meds are. And then understanding that the car crash that may not hurt somebody who's 25 years old and healthy could be seriously significant for somebody who's elderly. We have to be aware of that. Reassuring with assessment of vital signs and physical assessment ongoing and that things present just they look different. And then very much with pediatric, again, considering non-accidental trauma. And then it could be a low mechanism that has them injured, but they present different, they compensate longer. If we're not aware of that, we're neglecting our patient. Yeah. And, you know, we'll be clear, non-accidental trauma can occur in any age population. But that being said, when we do consider that, we you want to consider the vulnerable populations who are going to be at higher risk for it. And so, yes, certainly this includes our elderly and pediatric populations. This wraps up the principles. This wraps up the document. So tell me, how do you move forward with this? How, how do you train these concepts to your staff? Ross, that's a great question. And this in itself is probably an episode unto itself about how you roll out something like this, because it's more than introducing a procedure. If we went out and we got a new a new I.O. drill, we do a training, maybe a video, hands-on, pop it in a couple times, and you replace the mechanism. What we're talking about here is change and transition. Change happens when I replace the I.O. drill. The transition happens because it has to. When I pick up the new drill, I just have to use the new one. Here we're saying, take something that you're very comfortable with, and that is the way you've run trauma, the way you've done it your way. Now let go of what you're comfortable with and do it in a way that you're not comfortable until you get comfortable with it. And that's not easy. So we've really got to, and we're still in the process of this, but rolling it out, getting the buy-in that this was assembled by medics, ED physicians, EMS physicians trauma surgeons. It has a bigger view than just what happens on your call. It's what's best for our patients getting by in that way and just encouraging that change and not letting go of that. This is a long process. We may see shifts in, in scene times and then realize later that our IV successes are dropping because of it. So we just need to pay attention to all of it and continue to message ad nauseum. <laughs> I love realizing that this is bigger than just your call and how I can't stress enough these things that we talked about in this document with these principles and these actions set us up for success in the emergency department. And if we're set up for success in the emergency department, the patient is going to do better. And so these things that you do, these principles, these actions that you do pre-hospitally make a big difference for the patient in the emergency department, not just pre-hospitally. We did this with cardiac arrest. We taught the difference between ROSC and survivability. And I don't think anybody disputes that now. When I learned paramedicine, we high-fived over ROSC. That was a big deal. I got pulses. Well, buddy, you lost them five minutes later. But I got the win. Did my job. <laughs> yeah, did my job. So I think we can get this message across. The expanded worldview of the paramedic on these calls is what makes the difference. The injury happened seven minutes before you got on scene. Don't waste time on scene. Don't think that, oh, it's only been six minutes because now it's actually 13 minutes. That's a bigger deal. And then what happens after? It's not just about arriving to the hospital with the way you see your patient. It's what's going to be best for them to survive. You talked about Going back and looking at this and seeing what it's done to your system and addressing those issues, how do you make this document better than it is moving forward? So we refined the multi-patient aspect. We breezed over salt. We're, we're going to come back and talk about that. We're going to refine that, work it. There's a lot of operational components. I want to add more principles. I want a principle of the assessment. What are we looking for in a patient? What do those findings mean? And how do they determine my care? Still in a prioritization standpoint, when I find this and this, what's more important? Additionally, what of those play into whether it's an emergent return or not? 
a lot of our inclusion criteria for studying this was what did we do on our on our emergent returns? Well, what did we do on our non-emergent returns? It still plays in. So what is our guidance for if you find this, do this, help with that algorithmic principle aspect? Communication. We communicate with a lot more people than just the physicians. That's our clinical communication that we often think of. It's our default there. How do I communicate with the dispatchers? How do I communicate with other agencies? What can we do to make sure that there's less confusion on these calls? Because the more stress I can remove through the course of a call, the more of the brain a paramedic can put on the clinical aspects. And I want to remove all of the cognitive weight that goes with these calls, the stressors, to just get to the clinical stuff. You mentioned certain outcomes that be successful. Are there ways you guys study this? We have a lot of historical data and trauma. We work with a level one trauma center with a lot of historical data. My long-term goal is to have trauma registry similar to the cardiac arrest registry. I want to know what did the paramedics do that helps drive the outcome? Our hospital system has a 98% survival rate. How much of that is dictated by what the paramedics do? How much of that of the 2% is impacted by poor decisions, by decisions that could be better. So the long-term goal is to have a whole database set up that can, can assess this. Other than that, we can still look at patient outcomes. We have all of that information, feedback on individual calls, peer review on the, on the quality side, and really looking at what are we doing in each of the phases and how is it driving those calls. And then feedback from the crews. How does it feel for them? It may feel uncomfortable, but do they say like the call ended went smoother, even though it was uncomfortable. Anything else you want to include here as we wrap this up? Again, I don't think this carries on with the ideal trauma, but I think it, it should carry on to every other call. Paramedics need to expand the worldview of the calls they're on. And I did it for an entire career as a paramedic. My clock started the minute I walked on scene. And if somebody told me that they had pain in their leg and it was 10 out of 10, I thought, well, cool. It just started a second ago. It's only been, I've only seen you in pain for a minute, but it could have been hours or days, whatever the case is. Before the call happens, there was a lot that happened before I got there. A lot that happened before 911 was activated, potentially. I need to, to, as an empathetic provider, I need to weigh that. And then understand that all I see is all there is on an ambulance, but there's a whole world after that. What happens in the emergency department, in hospital stay, rehab? What does the long-term outcome of this patient based on what I'm doing, not just what I'm doing. Oh man, you're speaking to my soul. You're speaking to my soul about how these things impact the patient's care throughout their course, their hospital stay, how you're a part of the continuum and what you do matters. I love that. Thanks so much for coming on, Dave. I look forward to having you and Will Barry come back to talk about these multi-patient incidents and having you on for more stuff as well. Thanks, Ross. I appreciate it.